My name is Ricky and I work as innovation officer at a company called Notes. Uh, we specialize in working with uh, social media and as such I thought it would be interesting to take a look at the social media landscape of today. If we look at um, today's social media landscape, um, what is actually taking place is, uh, is a very heavy fragmentation. Uh, we have a couple of key players like uh, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube and they are big, big mastodons with Facebook just uh, reaching more than 1 billion monthly users uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, Twitter is obviously also very huge, um, not only in terms of size, uh, Twitter's user numbers are not official but they have several hundred million users every month, um, but also in terms of relevance. And relevance is something that you need to look at um, since size is not the only uh, important factor here. Um, that creates a space for niche platforms such as, for instance, Snapchat, which can be described as sort of a filterless Instagram. Uh, when, I, when I say it's filterless, uh, it means two things. Uh, one, it's a, it's a service that revolves around sharing uh, images and video with your friends, um, but it doesn't have the filters that, for instance, Instagram provides. Um, another platform that is interesting is called Vidi. It was acquired relatively quickly by Twitter. Um, the normal cycle for a platform like Vidi is that it tries to grow and accelerate its user base as aggressively as it can, and then trying to be acquired by one of the big players so that uh, all of the investors make a lot of money. Video was acquired very early, um, and I think that Twitter will use it uh, pretty actively in terms of uh, giving their users some sort of new opportunities for, for creating and spreading content. Basically what social media is going through right now and has been going through for the past couple of years is some sort of coming of age process. Uh, it is no longer just a new and exotic thing uh, and in order to uh, participate and involve yourself as for instance a brand on these platforms uh, you have to have uh, a strategy. Uh, you need to know what you're doing and you need to find out why exactly you are there. What has happened is that we have moved away from an internet era called Web 2.0 into something else which can loosely be called uh, Web 3.0 um, since we don't have necessarily a better name for it right now. Um, Web 2.0 was a radical shift in the way that the internet worked. Um, it provided the user with uh, a much, much quicker route from uh, getting an idea uh, into putting it into a production phase and then finally the distribution process. Uh, with the emergence of uh, Web 2.0 platforms such as Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Flickr and all of the other ones. Um, the user was now able to just pick up his uh, cell phone, take an image or shoot a video, upload it to some platform and the next day it could have been seen by one million people. That is something very radical compared to for instance just 10 years ago uh, or 15 years ago. Um, that was Web 2.0 and what happens when you give users uh, the ability to, to uh, create content like that is that they go absolutely nuts. And when they create a lot of content, then the next uh, obvious uh, consequence of that is that users have to uh, actively choose uh, which content they wish to see. Um, in Web 3.0, we would have what we would call a content abundance rather than a content scarcity. Uh, and this abundance is just uh, so staggering that it's difficult to grasp uh, when you look at uh, some numbers. Um, for instance, an hour of video is uploaded every second to YouTube. Uh, when Twitter peaks, it has more than 15,000 tweets per second. And Facebook now hosts more than 4% of every photograph taken in the history of the world. These numbers are so huge. Um, and if you also look at the fact that 90% of the data in the world was created over the past two years, uh, that is just uh, both amazing but also a little bit frightening. Um, what will also take place in Web 3 Condo is something that we call the Internet of Things. Um, real life objects like uh, an electrical light bulb or perhaps even your fridge, they will go online. They will have Wi-Fi built into them and you'll be able to, uh, uh, to uh, engage with them, for instance, through a smartphone app we no longer consider content to be the king. Uh, content was the king throughout all of Web 2.0 since it now enabled the users to, uh, to create all this content. What we now say, um, or some say at least, is that curation is king. And that is how we 
filter away all of the uh, noise from the signal. So this selection process is uh, extremely important since there now is such a big abundance of, of content. Um, and the curation process can be uh, compared to, for instance, a curator working at a museum uh, who, wish to, uh, who wishes to, to select for instance, 20 pieces of art that has to fit into a certain context. Uh, and this selection process uh, takes many, many things into consideration in order to fit the context. Uh, and this curation process is how we learn to navigate in this, um, in this world of extreme content uh, abundance. Um, since it is obviously not uh, possible at all to read every tweet uh, or watch every YouTube video, uh, I will, as a user, be uh, forced to participate in both active and passive um, curation processes. Uh, and one way of looking at this is that, uh, as a user, I can um, actively uh, choose how to have content presented to me, for instance, by selecting who to follow on Twitter, uh, who to subscribe to on YouTube, or which friends to uh, hide from Facebook if they only post content that is uh, merely noise to me. Um, another interesting concept is that we have gone from a shift where we used to have uh, human gatekeepers, that was for instance the old editors uh, on a television channel or newspapers, and they chose for me which content would be relevant. Um, they took many things into consideration uh, and uh, tried uh, optimally to ensure a fair, balanced, and very uh, diverse uh, set of content to, to show to their users. Um, these human gatekeepers have now, uh, in this uh, digital world, they have disappeared, but they have been uh, replaced uh, by robot gatekeepers. And these robot gatekeepers, they, uh, they consist of extremely advanced algorithms, and most of the big uh, internet platforms, or social media platforms, use them. One potential problem with these robot gatekeepers is that they are almost too good. Uh, we can no longer be sure to be shown uh, a diverse uh, image or picture of uh, what a complicated topic might actually look like. Um, this is very important, in, especially in terms of politics. Uh, and if I uh, uh, favor one side of, of the topic, then, uh, then it will certainly be shown in the way that I search and click on, on links. Um, Google will learn that instantly and, uh, and they will make sure that they show me more of this content. Uh, and that might be a potential problem in a, in a democratic country that, that actually wishes to ensure that people are shown a diverse uh, uh, image of what our topic is. We've also seen a shift in the way that search is made. Um, if we look at the push versus pull perspective, um, you might say that Google obviously is a, is a big pull platform where you visit Google to pull out information that you wish to see. Um, Facebook, on the other hand, also has had a search function, obviously, but uh, the way that it serves information to its users has been push. Um, when I'm friends with someone, uh, when I visit my newsfeed, I see content that is pushed to me uh, by that friend if he or she writes anything. Um, and if I like a brand's page, then that is the same deal. So it's merely um, a push channel. Um, push, uh, push, in my opinion, will be a factor increasing uh, the noise to signal ratio. Uh, and pull will be more valuable when you are actually looking for information rather than just entertainment in the future. What Google, Google has been extremely good at is providing uh, context sensitive searches uh, which take many things into uh, consideration. Um, Facebook has now created their own uh, competitor to Google called Gra Graph Search, and even though it's not uh, open to all users yet, uh, it certainly has a lot of potential. The thing is this, it might not necessarily be important uh, to me uh, when, when viewing this push versus pull, uh, that you sit at a Berlin cafe right now drinking a cup of coffee. That might actually just be bothersome and a part of the noise rather than the signal. But it might be extremely valuable to me when I visit Berlin uh, to be able to see which cafes my friends have gone to and how they rated it and what they bought, etc. So by providing this uh, graph search, uh, Google uh, will have a new uh, competitor in Facebook uh, and I think that they should not be taking this lightly, since 
if we look at how much information that Facebook has about you and all of your friends and all of your friends' friends, it will be able to, if they refine the algorithm in a good way, to show you some very, very uh, advanced search results. If we look at the way that marketing and communications take place now on social media platforms such as Facebook or Twitter, and there has also been a, a drastic shift here. Uh, it is clear that the users have been empowered, and you could say that they now have a certain strength in numbers, since a lot of users uh, are able to communicate with each other about a certain brand or company. Um, the playing field has, so to speak, been uh, leveled out, uh, and the, the brands and companies must now be very aware of this when communicating to the users. We have, we have moved from uh, the traditional one-way communication where, where the brands uh, would, for instance, just place a banner ad uh, at a highway or make a TV commercial uh, into a two-way communication, which could be uh, enabling the users to send an email or a text message to the brand. Uh, what we've changed to is something that you could call a conversation, where all of the uh, participants in the conversation are more or less um, on the same level. Uh, so it is one big conversation uh, where the brand is placed at the same uh, height uh, as, as the users participating in the conversation. Um, and what this does is that it frightens a lot of different brands and, and, and companies. Um, but the thing that they should be very aware of is that this conversation takes place uh, even though you don't participate in it. So it is a big advantage to have this conversation take place on your own Facebook page, for instance, uh, where you can then uh, try to manage and control and interact uh, with this conversation uh, instead of just ignoring it. One final point to notice is that you should not fear your users, but that you should do respect them. Uh, and this is important uh, because they now have this uh, power. Um, fearing your users will only lead to worse communication uh, between brand and user, since you will be too scared to actually come across with and the points that you wish to make. It's also very important uh, to have a very strictly defined uh, communication escalation plan, especially uh, in times of criticism. Um, most companies will at some point face some sort of communication crisis, and here it's very important uh, that the uh, relevant uh, employee is able to uh, escalate the communication to, to a higher level in the organization. Uh, instead of trying to answer everything uh, yourself, um, it's very good to know when you need to find, uh, for instance, your boss and have them, uh, have, have them uh, get the message out. And then in terms of marketing, um, what we see here is that there's a much more intense focus on um, creating ongoing value for the users. This is done uh, more and more by, for instance, creating utilities rather than just temporary uh, campaigns. Uh, these will still uh, play a central role in uh, branding and marketing on Facebook, um, but we will see more and more uh, utilities uh, on, on these social media platforms. And what these utilities can actually do is that they can create uh, a loyalty uh, from the user to your product by increasing the value of your product over time. Uh, so if a user can use your product for um, some time and then receive some sort of actual benefit by using your product over time, that will be able to differentiate you from your competitors. So what brands should have a very clear focus on is creating more value over time by using your product rather than maintaining a neutral or even less uh, value over time. This can be done in several different ways. For instance, by uh, obtaining uh, data from your users and using them in different uh, contexts. For instance, it would be very valuable for your customer service uh, department to be able to see um, uh, different uh, social data from your users. For instance, whether they like the competitor's page or not, or whether they just got married or even divorced. Um, so using all of the information that you can get through social media very actively in order to uh, keep your customers in your business um, will play a very central part in the future. Thank you.